Oh, hey, what are you doing here? Chapel? Yeah, it's my favorite. Let's get into it. What's your favorite part about chapel? Mine is our Bible scripture memory. You ready? Let's go. Hey, kindergarten, are you having a great day? Here is your verse for this week. Hey, first grade, here's your verse for the week. Second grade, how are you? Verse, here you go. all you guys. Third grade, here's your verse. Fourth grade, how you doing? Here's your verse for the week. And last and certainly not least, the fifth grade. We love you guys. Here's your verse for the week. Hiding God's truth in your hearts and in your minds is one of the most important things. And I find that the easiest way to do that is through singing God's truth. This song comes from Life Tree Kids. Once again, if you like this music, go to the YouTube channel and check out all the wonderful songs that they have. The name of this song is called Good in Every Way. I'm going to lift my voice to glorify my King. What an amazing truth. Let's stand. Let's do the hand motions. We hope that you love this song. Join with me, everybody sing. I'm gonna lift my voice to glorify my King. He is a mighty God and worthy of our praise. We give Him everything, He's good in every way. Come on now, join with me, everybody sing. I'm gonna lift my voice to glorify my King. He is a mighty God and worthy of our praise. What an amazing song. This next song comes from Answers VBS. Again, check out their YouTube channel if you love songs like this. The name of this song is God With Us. Jesus came to live for us, to die for us. Emmanuel, God with us. Let's keep standing, do the hand motions, hide God's truth in your heart. We hope you love this song.
Man, that was a great song. I love singing with you guys. Now it is our Bible time. I hope you've enjoyed these lessons. Today is the last in our series called, What Does the Bible Say? We have talked about a lot of things to see what God has to say about it. We've talked about our chores. We talked about what the Bible says about how we should use our words. We've also looked in the Bible to see what God has to say about how we treat our siblings and our brothers and sisters. And today we're gonna to talk about our parents. What does the Bible say about our parents? Our parents, more than anyone else, just want us to listen to them. Last week we talked about how our parents are the ones who tell us uh, not to rough house with our brothers and sisters, to be careful, don't do this, eat your vegetables, clean up your room, the ones that tell us instructions and things to do all the time. You know who can get on your nerves more than your siblings? Sometimes it's your mom and your dad. Your parents, right? They're your biggest heroes in this world. They brought you into this world. They taught you how to walk and how to talk. They held you when you were small. They took care of you. They feed you. They teach you. Parents do so many things for us. But sometimes as kids, it feels like our parents get in our way. You know, our parents are always saying, don't do that. Don't touch that. You better listen. You better sit up straight because I told you so, right? Have you heard your parents say any of these things? It's easy to get frustrated the more and more our parents tell us what to do. What's a kid to do these days? Well, just for consistency's sake, let's ask the question one more time. What does the Bible say? Well, I got my Bible right here. I wanna read what God has to say about how we are to treat and listen to our moms and our dads, our parents. It's found in Ephesians chapter six, verses one through three. Let me read this to you. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Wow, that's an amazing promise, isn't it? Well, to help us learn this truth and this lesson a little bit more, I looked in the Bible to try to find a Bible story that had to deal with a child responding and listening to their mom or their dad. And I came up with a story that I wanna share with you. It's kind of long, but it's a really, really, really good story. It's the story of Esther. Now, before we read, I want you to pay attention to two people. Number one, Esther, and number two, Mordecai. Would love to read this story to you, so buckle in. We hope you enjoy this. Are you ready for the story? Here we go. King Xerxes, also known as Ahasuerus, was the most powerful man in the world. In the third year of his reign, he invited all the nobles and the princes to a feast which lasted 180 days. King Xerxes ruled over the empire of the Medes and the Persians, which stretched over 127 provinces in Ethiopia to India. Living in his empire were many Jews. After the feast, the king invited everyone to his palace in Susa, or Shushan, to another feast which lasted another seven days. There were white and green and, and blue, hangings fastened with fine linen cords to silver rings. There were beds of silver and gold on pavements of red and blue and black and white marble. Everyone drank from cups of gold. Queen Vashti gave a party for the women in another part of the palace. At the end of the seven days, the king, who was drunk, ordered his seven servants to fetch Queen Vashti so he could show her off to all of his friends and show how beautiful she was. But they reported back that the queen refused to join him. The king was furious. His wise men advised him saying, the queen has not only insulted you, but everyone. She has set a bad example in not showing honor to her husband. The queen's title and estate was taken from her. A law was made and read aloud throughout the land that all wives must honor and obey their husbands. Who would replace Vashti as queen? A search took place throughout the land for the most beautiful young woman, and they were brought to the palace under the supervision of Hegai, the king's servant. Working in the palace was a Jew called Mordecai. Mordecai had a cousin named Esther, also known as Hadassah, whom he had brought up because her parents had died. 
Esther was a beautiful young girl and chosen to join the other contestants at the palace for 12 months of beauty treatments. Mordecai advised her not to tell anyone she was a Jew. Now something to pay attention to, Mordecai was acting as the father for Esther because Esther's mom and dad died when she was younger. So I want you to pay attention to the relationship between Mordecai and Esther. Mordecai is acting as Esther's dad. Of the many women chosen, Esther was the one the king loved the most, and she was crowned as queen instead of Vashti. A feast was given in her honor, but she told no one that she was a Jew. This king, King Xerxes, was an enemy king, and they conquered the nation of Israel. That's just an important detail to know. A little while later, Mordecai was guarding the king's gate and overheard two servants, Bigvan and Teresh, plotting against the king. Mordecai immediately warned Esther of the plot, and she told the king. The two plotters were arrested, found guilty, and hung on a tree. Their plot was recorded in the Chronicles of the King's Reign, where it was noted that Mordecai uncovered the plot and saved the king. The king promoted Haman above all the other princes to be the second most powerful man in the kingdom. All the servants working at the king's gate would bow to Haman. However, Mordecai would not bow before Haman or show him reverence. Why do you break the king's command and not bow down to honor Haman? The servants asked. They knew Mordecai was a Jew. They kept asking, but Mordecai would not listen to them. They reported the matter to Haman, who was furious to find Mordecai, the Jew, did not bow to revere him. Haman schemed to find a way to punish not only Mordecai, but his people, the Jews, also. Haman went to the king and said, There are people living in the land who have their own laws and obey them rather than the king's commands. A law must be passed so they can be destroyed. I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's treasury to get this done. What do you think, kids? Is Haman a good guy or a bad guy? He's paying the king right now to make sure all the Jews are killed. That's crazy. The king took off his signet ring and gave it to Haman. Keep the money and do to these people what you think is best. The king's scribes were instructed to write a law that on the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jews were to be attacked and killed and their possessions taken as plunder. The law was sealed with the king's ring. The law of the Medes and the Persians could not be changed or altered. The new law was announced throughout the entire empire. What's going on here? This is kind of crazy. Now when the Jews heard the law of the Medes and the Persians to have them killed on the 13th day of the 12th month, they started weeping and wailing. Many of them put on sackcloth and ashes as a sign of mourning and sadness. When Mordecai heard of Haman's plans to kill the Jews, he tore his clothes, he put on itchy sackcloth and ashes, and he went around the city wailing bitterly. When Esther heard of Mordecai's distress, she sent Hathak, one of the king's servants, with clothes for him to put on instead of sackcloth, but he refused to put them on. Hathak was sent back again by Esther to find out what was troubling Mordecai. Mordecai gave Hathak the text of the new law and explained how much Haman had promised to pay into the treasury to destroy the Jews. So remember, Mordecai is acting as Esther's dad and he's telling her to do something very, very, very important. You see, Esther was also a Jew, and if Haman could have his way, Esther would have to be killed along with Mordecai and all the people. That's pretty scary. Hathak reported back to Esther, anyone who approaches the king's inner chamber without being summoned by the king is put to death unless the king extends his golden scepter to them and spares their life. I have not been summoned by the king for 30 days. So just so you know, Esther, the new queen, couldn't just go into the room of the king. If she did, she could be killed unless the king picked up his golden staff and said, it's okay. So what Mordecai is asking Esther to do is very, very dangerous. Esther, 
you should go to the king and tell him of this evil plan to kill the Jews. Esther's words were reported back to Mordecai. He sent her back this message. Don't think because you live in the palace, you alone of all the Jews will escape. If you remain silent, the Jews will perish. Who knows, but you being chosen as queen to help us for such a time as this. That's a really interesting thing to say. Esther, guess what? God put you as queen for such a time as this to go and talk to the king so the Jews can be saved. Esther sent a reply to Mordecai. Gather all the Jews in Susa and pray and fast for me. Don't eat for three days. I will pray and fast with you. Then I will go to the king, even though he has not summoned me. If I die, I die. What do you think about Esther? She is so brave. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robe and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. When the king saw her, he was pleased. And guess what? Do you think he killed her or let her in? That's right. He held up his golden scepter to spare her life. What is your request? He asked. Even if you ask up to half my kingdom, I will give it to you. I would like to invite the king and Haman to a special banquet I have prepared, Esther replied. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. So what is your request? The king asked. I would like to invite the king and Haman to another banquet tomorrow. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman left the palace in a good mood. But when he saw Mordecai had not bowed or showed him respect, he was full of rage. Haman went to his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and boasted to them about his great wealth, his many sons, and the ways the king had honored him. I have been invited by the king and the queen tomorrow, but I cannot be happy while Mordecai the Jew is sitting at the king's gate. You see, Haman hated Mordecai. Haman's the bad guy. Mordecai is like Esther's dad. Haman hated him so much, he wanted to have him killed. Skipping ahead a little bit, Haman was summoned to attend the banquet Queen Esther had prepared for him and the king. As they were drinking wine, the king asked, So Esther, what is your request? Even if it's half of my kingdom, it will be granted to you. My request is that you save my life and the lives of my people, Esther replied. We are to be destroyed. Who has dared to threaten your life? The king demanded to know. An enemy, replied Esther, this vile Haman. Haman looked terrified. The king got up in a rage and went out to the palace garden. Haman started begging Esther to save his life. The king returned to find Haman falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The guards were called and they took Haman. You know, Haman wanted to kill Mordecai because he hated him so much. But this time, it was Haman who got the punishment. That day, the king gave Esther Haman's estate. Esther told the king that she was related to Mordecai. The king gave Mordecai Haman's signet ring, and Esther appointed him to look after Haman's riches and possessions. Esther fell at the king's feet, weeping and begging him to put a stop to the evil plan to kill the Jews. If it pleases the king, let an order be written overruling Haman's plan. What such good news! Isn't this great? Mordecai recorded these events and sent letters to the Jews asking them to celebrate this victory every year on the 14th and 15th days of the 12th month. Haman plotted to cast a lot known as Pur to destroy the Jews, so the celebration was called the Feast of Purim. What an amazing story. What do you think about that? Now, don't forget, Mordecai was acting as Esther's dad because she didn't have a mom and dad. And Mordecai told her to do something very, very, very important. Esther, you got to go to the king and tell him of Haman's evil plan or we're all going to die. You know, what if Esther said, Mordecai, I don't want to do that. It's too hard. Then they would have all been destroyed. But what did she end up doing? She obeyed. She listened. She trusted God and she did the right thing. I want to remind us of today's verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may, may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. 
I know sometimes it's hard to listen to your mom and dad, especially when you want to do something really, really, really bad like watch a show or get a snack because you, you think you're hungry or go out and play on something that you know you're not supposed to and you know you hear those words, no, or you can't. And you start welling up inside and you just want to start whining and crying and, and oh, why not? Why not? Don't you love me, mom and dad? But here's the thing, your mom and dad, they do love you. Maybe sometimes it doesn't feel like they do, but they really do love you. Your mom and dad have watched you grow from a tiny baby to a young person right now. And they are consistently amazed by all the things that you do. They pray for you and they want you to be able to do your best in everything you do. It's easy to be frustrated when you don't get your way, but here's a challenge for you. Why don't you take a piece of paper or, or write down a few things of all the things that your mom and dad do for you. Think about it. They go to work to make money so that you can have electricity to turn the lights on. Uh, they cook food for you. They make food for you. Um, they give you good advice so you don't get in trouble. They buy clothes for you so you have some good clothes to wear. They answer your questions and they help you to understand things that you don't know. They get you toys to have fun and play with. They take you places to see your friends and have a fun time. They help you go to sleep when you're scared at night. They wash and clean your clothes so you have clean clothes to wear. They pray for you that you'll grow up to be a young man or young woman that knows and pleases the Lord. And the list goes on and on and on. But the instruction is so good. Kids, children, obey your parents. Why? Because the Lord has given you these parents and it's so, so good. And life makes sense and works the way it's supposed to if you honor your father and mother. What does it mean to honor your father and mother? Well, it means to respect them, to show them by the way we act, by how we think and how we speak. Mom and dad, I believe that God gave you me and I want to obey you. I wanna follow what you say because I know that what you tell me is right. Our parents should never tell us to do something that's wrong or sinful or bad. Our parents should get their instructions from God. And that's why it's important for kids to obey mommy and daddy because mommy and daddy are to obey God. So what does the Bible say about our parents? Well, God says, hey, we should obey them. And that's not a, oh, okay, I'll obey my mom and dad. No, it's thank you, God, for giving me a mom and a dad to take care of me. I will listen and obey them. Thank you, God. You know, not everyone has a mom and dad. Some kids live with their grandparents or live with someone else that, like Mordecai, was a, was a dad to Esther because she didn't have a mom and dad. But you know, whoever's in charge of you in your house and in your life, the Bible says you should obey, honor, and respect them. And that's a good thing that God has given us, to honor and respect those that God has put in charge of us. But why should you obey your mom and your dad? Well, because you love God. Why should you love God? Well, the Bible tells us because God loves us first. And he showed us his love. He demonstrated his love to us. He showed us how much he loves us. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin, to take away all the bad and the evil out of us, the sin that we have sinned against God. He came back up from the dead to give us brand new life so we don't have to whine and complain. We can have a new heart and a new spirit that says, God, I will obey you as I obey my mom and my dad. Do you know who Jesus Christ is? Has there ever been a time in your life where you got alone with God and you said, God, I know I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe Jesus came back from the dead. Lord, I believe in you. Please save me from my sin. If you ever talk to God and you make that decision, the Bible says that he comes inside you and changes your life to be able to follow him and do what he asks you to do. That's such good news. Kids and families, we love you and we miss you. We hope that we get to see you soon. We know that school is almost over. Hopefully the coronavirus will go away and we can get back to life as normal. But in the meantime, we're thankful that we can keep meeting with you this way. We love you and we miss you. And we'll see you in the next one.